everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for episode three of the Beyond Insights podcast. Very excited to be here. And I'm here with Gareth Macbeth today, who is one of our lead engineers at SIFT. Uh, so today we're talking about all things cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a really important topic. Uh, today you can do just about everything online from shopping to email, banking, remote work. And cybersecurity has been in the news a lot lately because... Uh, there are so many hacks, even on like very, very big um, companies and big websites. Um, so lots of, yeah, even big companies can be very vulnerable to cyber attacks. So I thought we would talk to Gareth today about how you can make sure that your data is secure. Yeah, oh, yeah great. Thanks for having me on. Um, I mean, I don't claim to be a cybersecurity expert, but I've uh, been at SIP now for the past five years. I've definitely been experienced and I've become acclimatized to the best practices one should follow in an organization for security. Um, and in doing so, I've um, obviously implemented a whole bunch ourselves from the get-go. And I'm just going to basically discuss how we as our organization have secured ourselves and how you as an organization or an individual can ensure that you follow these best practices to ensure your own security on the internet. So, so maybe you can give us a bit of a background about yourself. Um... Yeah, about your time at SIFT, what you were doing before, what led you to be here today. Perfect, yeah. So as I said, I joined SIFT Analytics around five years ago. Uh, then I joined as one of two engineers. Uh, we have now ex experienced exponential growth to about 20 engineers mm -hmm. and to a team size of around 70-ish, I'd say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been quite a ride. Um, and it's great to be in a startup because you have experienced a lot of like small business uh, struggles as well as like, how to solve that. Like, key problems and actually see direct results from what you do. Um, yeah, when I joined, I had come directly from university. So I studied in Stellenbosch, which was a beautiful wine country. Um, and yeah, from that point onwards, I think I interned in the year prior to me joining for about a month or so. And then I joined along with the founders, one of their first companies and then moved over shortly after to Sift Analytics. So Gareth has really been here through all the many phases of SIFT. Even since I've joined, we've seen so many things changing, and you've really been there for it all. Very, very cool. Well, it's been and been an interesting ride, and it's obviously a lot more exciting stuff to come from SIFT, which is great. Sure. Um, so why are we talking about cybersecurity today? Why is this something that um, you think people should be aware of and should be investing time and money in? Yeah, well, I mean, it's pretty much your first line of defense, your security. Um, doesn't matter if you've got your intellectual property, your data, your client security, as well as your own personal information, you should always guarantee that it is as secure as possible. So in essence, you should never be experiencing like concerns or going to sleep at night being like, is there a concern that my data is out there? Has my card details been leaked? Or just general concerns like that. So with the growing uh, move to everyone going to cloud and the world going more tech driven, uh, it makes sense that security should become the number one focus for all users and individual and organizations. Um, and in doing so, we always talk about the key points on that today, but nothing, obviously there's always going to be chances that people can get through, but we can only ensure that we follow the best practices that what we are aware of. Right? Sure. So what are some of your top tips that you can recommend for organizations? Um, well, I mean, obviously there's the key ones. So like as an organization, you can just have to ensure strict like security policies. So at SIP, for example, we undergo biannuals every six months security training as well as an ongoing security audit throughout the year. Um, and doing so, like just include your standard stock basics, such as passwords. Um, passwords, for example, like obviously the usual uh, must be super like ambiguous. They should never relate back to you. Like and although it seems- your birthday or exactly, first name or it should anything. Know, like date five or back yes. so. Yeah. And although it seems like common sense, more often than not, you'd be surprised at how much there is. it is not common sense. Um, but yeah, so it's just like your standard things with passwords. Um, a more key one nowadays would become would be VPNs or virtual private networks. And the reason that's so key is especially driven by um, remote work. So virtual private networks allow like a remote worker or a remote employee to access like key um, company resources or the internet remotely through a secure tunnel or through a secure network. Uh, and that's become more and more critical as the years have gone. I think especially, you know, often people work at the airport and they like to use the free airport Wi-Fi. Um, and I know you've told me this is really not advisable. Uh, yeah. Why is that? Uh, well, in essence, uh, public Wi-Fi, whenever you access a network that you do not have control of, that you don't know how it's been set up or configured, you don't know the security behind it, you should always be cautious to what you put on um, and how you access it. 
that VPNs do help eliminate some of that risk as it does anonymize who you are on the network. But at the same time, you are always at risk if you're on a public network. So it's always better to either use just your mobile data, a hotspot, um, but you should never ever with company resources access public network without pre-authorization. And in terms of getting your team trained on all the important um, things for security, what would you recommend? Um, well, I mean, there's many practices. So as I said, the security training once every six months or more frequent if you if you that's what suits your business. But whether or not that sticks with client uh, with your employees uh, is up to them. Um, but another great security practice that you can follow um, is also just your standard like phishing attempts. So you can set up fake scenarios within the business to see how well client, uh, your employees are stuck with a certain like key aspect. For example, phishing. So you could send out fake phishing emails to see which of your employees click on those emails. Although it sounds like entrapment, it's not in essence that. It's just to ensure that we can then reiterate the risks that then are posed by these kind of vulnerabilities and just how cautious you have to be when dealing with confidential data. It's kind of like I've re uh, received a few emails that are supposed to be from Van, our CEO, um, asking if he can just talk to me about something or if he can borrow money from me. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of being alert to those kind of emails that hmm, there's something a little bit weird about this. Why would he want me to um, be lending him money? Yeah, and it always tell you not to go and contact them in person. So, I mean, if that's not a red flag, and people do do that, which I wouldn't be surprised if they do, it's uh, a red flag in our books. Um, and what do you think are some of the biggest risks for data security? I mean, there's, okay, there's many. The list is ever growing. The more and more we move to cloud and more we go towards fully tech driven society. Um, but the major ones are obviously cyber attacks, as I've mentioned, phishing, malware, and ransomware. So to just top on that, so phishing is basically, as Alex said, where people try and impersonate someone else in the business to try and give you to voluntarily give up our confidential data. And then ransomware is also one where if you're accessing like, um, either downloading applications that aren't authorized or suspicious applications or opening certain files from a website that then get into your system and then prevent you from accessing the, your computer or Whereas if it connects to your company's intranet, prevent from accessing your, your actual company data. Um, and that's called ransomware because they hold your data ransom, right? Exactly. It's kind of exactly. like kidnapping your data. Yeah, they generally give you like a timeline or like certain like things to abide by or like you have to like give up data for them to like release certain aspects. So it's literally the worst case scenario. So thankfully it's not, it shouldn't be that common for the individual at all. It's more for your companies and your corporate enterprises that should be at risk of that. And that's why we have these strict security processes. And I guess that's why you need to make sure that none of your employees are downloading like random apps or random files. They're always checking everything um, before they download it. Exactly. So at the individual level, sure, that's 100% on you to keep, like to ensure that you always check your files and make sure that you're downloading things that are authentic. But on the company level, you can also ensure these strict security policies. So if you're using like Google Workspace, so where you have all your um, your custom domains so at setdownalytics.com or any of your business domains. Um, you can ensure that first you filter all the emails prior so they can run through virus checks, all that kind of stuff. So you can at least have that first line of defense before it reaches the employee. So even if there is a risk, at least that way, it's completely isolated, removed from the network, doesn't ever make it to you, which is a great start. Um, and then... Um, Oh, you can yeah. also, in terms of downloading applications, oh, there yes. are certain um, restrictions you can put in place, right? Exactly. So you get things called MDM, so like Apple MDM and Google, which which is a multi-device manager in essence. It prevents you, you can start putting restrictions on what applications are allowed in your company. So we've got strict restrictions on our systems that you can't download any pre, any unauthorized apps. So it has to be fully pre-authorized, come from the app store, can't be a browser download, for example. Um, and all those things obviously run through checks with permanent monitoring on all employees' laptops that we'd be alerted to if there was even a potential risk for that. I suppose because one of the biggest risks working within a business is the third party uh, software that you work with and making sure, especially if you're an accounting practice or any kind of business working with financial data or any kind of very confidential data, you want to make sure that any software that is handling that data is secure. Yeah, I know, exactly. And um, the biggest risk, obviously, with third party is. You can only be as secure as you want to be internally as an organization. However, when you start using third-party applications, which is inevitable and more often than not unavoidable, the, the security controls are out of your hands. Um, that falls onto the third party. So if ever they introduce a vulnerability or any risks on their side, you have no control, nor are you generally uh, exposed to what these vulnerabilities are. It's only once it's too late that then you figure out what the problem was. 
So there's always obviously a risk with, with their body so that's why you've just got to vet them from the get-go, see what their security compliance is, and do they follow their security practices. It's always good to start a conversation with their customer success teams, follow up with that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, you've always got to vet your third-party applications. And I know you also mentioned the other day compromised uh, devices or compromised yep. networks, those are also really big risks. Exactly. So, I mean, that's why you have got have strict firewall processes in place and our policies. So our network obviously is completely locked down in the office. Um, you can't access certain things on, you can't access anything to company like information unless you're on our network. Um, there's a lot of secure things you can do with that. So basically if we don't even have support VPN. If you want to access the system, you have to be in the office. Um, it's just, there's obviously a lot of things that can go wrong that we are only aware of once it has. So that's why we, we look at the, what's happening in the industry, what's happening in the world, and we retro well, we proactively um, try and sort of prevent that issue from happening. Yeah, so just we want of, to prevent yeah. it rather than treat exactly. it later on. And with like compromised devices, the problem with if you have a company intranet or um, like if you've got anything on premises, so like any hard drives or data that's physically stored for clients on premises, if someone with a compromised device or someone who's got a virus or ransomware, for example, on the device plugs into the network, it can then upload itself automatically to the intranet, which then can immediately take down your systems. So we have strict policies on that as well. So we never have devices plugged into the network. So there's no direct connection by cable, yeah. um, as well as everything goes through two firewalls before it reaches the actual like, system request, as well as we also don't do anything on premises because there's a lot of risks involved with that as well. Yeah, makes sense. No. Um, trying to remember what I was going to ask you next. Oh, well, I mean, I keep going on potential big, like threats. Like the yeah, other one, sure. Which in essence, stuff we sort we touched on a few aspects of it, but it's something called insider threats, which sounds like malicious, but it's not always intended to be malicious. So by insider threats, it's like any employees of the business um, can either compromise data or leak data. Sometimes there are malicious attempts where they physically got higher privileges than someone else, and now they're, they're going to like misuse that privilege to leak confidential data or share user information. But then you also get the non-intentional, like the that, like yeah, the users who don't realize that they're doing it. So yes. it can send it like with a compromised device where now they plug into the internet and now it starts key logging and scraping on like your screens and stuff and sending that out to the public. That's like an unintended, but in essence, it's an internal threat that you've got to always ensure that you are protected against. It's basically that thing that you're only as strong as your weakest link. Exactly. So if you're looking at that in terms of your employees, you need to make sure that the weakest link of your employees um, they know a bit about um, cybersecurity, about how to keep data safe, and also um, that you have the uh, principle of least privilege in case. Exactly. Um, which maybe you can talk a bit about what that means. Perfect. Well, yeah, I'd say principle of least privilege is definitely one of my favorite security practices that one can follow, and it should be like the industry standard, which it generally is accepted in the bigger corporates now. Mm. Um, and what principle of least privilege is, is pretty much exactly that. You give someone the least amount of privileges that they need, in order to execute their job effectively and efficiently. So that way you don't get the potential internal threat where a user has higher privileges than they should and then starts maliciously using it, as well as there's no unintended someone who accidentally leaks it. Yes. Um, and you just gotta continually do these reviews. So you've got to do like those internal like security reviews, how much permissions people have. Um, if I had, for example, access to our systems, but now I've moved from engineering to revenue, I don't need access to our code anymore. So that must sure. be immediately revoked from it. We need to do these like checks permanently and it should be something that's reviewed weekly if not monthly um, in a organization just to ensure especially if you have people offboarded that there's no excess permission lying around that someone can actually misuse and yeah right, yeah definitely very important when someone's leaving the organization that you get rid of all the access that they had to that um yeah information yeah confidential information that's what i was looking for Nice. Yeah, well, the best part with offboarding is, so we follow a strict process from an external company who does all of our like auditing of our systems and auditing of our business practices. So they keep us in check based to make sure we are following all these industry practices. Anytime a new like industry standard comes in, they enforce that, we enforce it kind of thing. So it's great. So they've got a permanent audit running on us across our entire organization. Um, and then one of those is um, facility checking, do we have offboarding processes in, pl in place? Have they kept, they can see all our systems and see had that person been offboarded from all the systems, flag it immediately, does anyone have excess permissions? So although it does take the load off from us from having to manage us all the time, it is always good practice to never just trust the software outright. You yes. must always do things and double check them yourselves.
And I suppose one of the other um, big security practices that we have at SIFT is penetration testing, which is, as I understand it, you're trying to protect the software from potential hackers. So you're trying to look at any kind of weaknesses that there might be. No. So it's essentially, yeah, so it's preventing it from hackers by hacking in the system. Yes. So um, we obviously have, we have staging environments of things that are completely separate to our production systems. So that way, obviously, while we're doing these tests and running out, running these tests, uh, we can't affect any like production system. We can't impact clients and nor can we ever impact their information because it's completely detached. Um, but, but it, it really kind is. of mimics our software. It's like a exactly. copy of, of what SIP looks like. Exactly. It's a one-to-one -one version of SIP without the data. Um, it's just with obviously test data. Yes. Um, the biggest pro to this is that you can catch vulnerabilities before they even reach the production system. So we ourselves do penetration testing internally where we run all these tests, be like, okay, well, can we like modify any of the data coming back or going to our servers? Can we basically maliciously act on the data to get data that's not ours or mutate it to just damage the system? So we also do a lot of internal testing on that, but at the same time, we have a lot of, we have a full penetration testing suite as well as external penetration testers as well for any potential high risk changes we'll get them involved uh, and they'll test our systems which currently they're testing seven days a week um 24 7. um so it's great now i've got a new policy in place um and as i say is whether our secure our system secure or not it's only secure up until this point until another vulnerability is announced globally for example like a sign up process with the multi-factor authentication they can enforce this immediately, and then we can then work proactively to quickly fix that before it becomes a problem for us. Oh, amazing. It's a continuous process. I think that's also the important thing that I've learned about cybersecurity. It's not like a one-sort concern. You have to constantly be reviewing your practices, um, especially as hackers and other cyber criminals get more clever and they've figured out different ways uh, to get into your system. You need to keep thinking about cybersecurity. Exactly. So, I mean, you can be a cyber security today and then tomorrow a massive vulnerability comes up and a thing that you were an expert in and you've guaranteed like it was secure against, someone's found some backdoor entrance into it or some like loophole in the system that now suddenly you have to like relearn how to solve that problem. But you've got to continually grow your knowledge base. And um, that's why you have to have a security team. So you can never have one individual that's going to like head up these things purely because there is just too much out there. There's too much knowledge. So you've got to have Continual keep keeping you in check. People keep you up to date for like APR security, um, data security, integrity of all the systems, all that kind of stuff. And um, you almost mentioned encryption there. I don't know yeah. if you can uh, talk about encryption a bit. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so a super important thing is obviously never ever transferring data or having data saved in plain text. So plain text meaning like the average user can just read the data okay. or the information. So in essence, you should always encrypt things that you pass over the network. So as we call it encryption in transit, as well as when you store it. So in our databases, every single bit of user data, uh, client's data, all their financial data is stored encrypted on the database. So even if we ourselves wanted to act maliciously inside uh, another insider threat, yes. we couldn't make sense of any of the data. It's purely is only decrypted and viewable to the user once they have logged in and using their authentic token. So it's a lot of there's a lot that goes into the encryption, obviously, to ensure that there's no middleman attacks or third party. So middleman being someone who intercepts the request while you're making it to our system or while it's been returned to us to basically modify certain aspects of it. Um, but we've got a lot of things in place for that, and that's where penetration testing comes in helpful because they can try and like commit all these crimes in yes. essence for us to solve them. Um, and as such, I mean, it's been successful to date. So, what's the most surprising thing that you've learned about cybersecurity? Well, to be fair, it's, it's not necessarily the cyber security itself that's been surprising. It's the fact that a lot of businesses, SaaS businesses being a prominent one as well, feel that security should be a privilege. So they're only generally offered on the higher plans. Um, when moving to cloud now, with everyone having their data online, it really should be a given that you, the user, should feel comfortable knowing that your information is out there and that your data is out there. There really shouldn't be any second thought, nor should you have to pay more to ensure that your data is more secure than the next person. Uh, it really should just be a given, which to me well, is definitely. still shocking. And I think also, if I think about all of the different um, security checks that we have in terms of like using our software, you can have two-factor authentication. You have the principle of least privilege in terms of like our user roles. So you can give someone like admin privileges or staff privileges or like client access is also limited. They can only see certain things. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you should generally, obviously, we try and build roles out as generically as possible to make sense for like, as um, Alex was saying, for the clients or for 
your main, like your admin users, but I would always suggest making your own bespoke roles. As much as, as convenient as it is just to choose a custom uh, pre-built role, you never know what additional permissions it's granting you. Mm -hmm. It's always better to just go and physically, even if you're ticking on the exact same things as one of our roles has predetermined, it's always better just to just make sure, okay, well, I know for a fact they have this, this feature or this access to this report, yes. rather than after the fact when the user told you, oh, I didn't realize I had access to this data. And now obviously you're not necessarily in trouble, but it's just awkward conversation yes. to have. Yeah. Sure. You also mentioned, I uh, remember, multi-factor authentication. Yes. Which is actually one thing I wanted to talk about as well in terms of like passwords. It is. It has been a great addition um, just in general. Like the industry seems to have accepted multi-factor authentication and made it like standard now across a lot of systems, um, which in essence, it's just another layer of protection on your password. So if you do have the guessable password of like password123 or it's Alex123, uh, yeah. um, it adds an additional layer of security that even if I was remotely guessing that password, I need a thing physically on my, either my device or my laptop or something that then gives me a limited time period, a limited code, six digit code on average to enter in just to authenticate that. It's kind so, of like the OTP you get when you're trying to pay with your banking app. Exactly that. Um, and it just gives you an additional like, peace of mind that even if someone gets, gets, gets your password, like your email password, you are secured against that. And a lot of our app partners um, have enforced this. The, the, the one that's taken charge of that, I'd say, is Zero as well. They've really gone all out that when they first rolled out, it was just for Oz partners, like the Australia region. And now they've gone, if you integrate at all, even if you're not initial, didn't initially come from Zero to our systems, there's now a requirement to be enforced on every single system that integrates with Zero. That's really good. So that's an example of how they are mitigating third-party risk. And I was just going to say do. that's how, like, if you're looking at a third-party software like Zero, you can go and like, say, oh, okay, they are forcing us to do this multi-factor authentication. They clearly take security seriously. No, that's exactly. And, I mean, that's one thing that everyone can enforce. So it's doing your due diligence, in essence, for third-party applications as well. So if, if someone wants to integrate with us, we would first reach out to them to see that they meet all our minimum security requirements before we even allow them to start reaching out to our system. Um... I suppose we've spoken a, a lot about <laughs> different best, best practices. Uh, on an individual level, what would you say, what would you recommend people to do to just keep their data secure? Yeah, I mean, in essence, it's pretty much everything we've touched on already, um, but just that obviously less of an intensity um, than what an organization or business would need. Um, so one thing, VPNs. VPNs really are a great practice um, to use. It does sound like it's, if you're not a tech person, like, oh no, what is a VPN? It's very easy just to enable. Our phones even have them built in nowadays. I'm pretty sure Android devices have them too. You can just literally switch it on and then it just anonymizes who you are on the internet. Prevents targeted advertising um, and just basically makes it that no one can uh, get know who you are on the internet and just secures all your data. And with your passwords, when you're making a password, would you recommend doing that thing? You know, I think Google and a few other sites have it where they recommend a password for you. I mean, yeah, in essence, so what they're using is something that uh, is uniquely uniquely identifiable fun set of characters. So it's like a super long character string. So I think it's like 32 characters on average, which is great because I mean that as long as you're more secure than the next person. Yes. So those passwords are way better than someone who's done a 12 character password. Granted, they're not easily rememberable, yeah. but that's why we have obviously all these password managers, um, all these authenticator apps. Um, but it really does give you that additional layer of security because it's a completely unguessable password. Mm -hmm. It will take a computer years, if not decades, to guess those kind of passwords. And I think the main thing is you just want to be more secure than the next person because hackers are lazy. They're going to want yeah. to go for the easiest target. Exactly. So that's like our philosophy. So we are always going to be more secure than any of our other app partners or anyone that's in our comp competition, basically. Um, because, as you say, hackers are inherently are lazy. They'll always look to go to the easiest, like the, where the low-hanging fruit is. So yeah, maybe if, I should say they're opportunistic, not lazy. But uh, well, in any sense, yeah. We're, we're not going to uh, compliment hackers. Yeah, we're not going to categorize okay. hackers. Uh, and they say white hat hackers. Then, then they're doing. So white hat hackers. Oh, so um, yeah, so you have to get black hat hackers and white hat hackers. Black hat ha hackers act maliciously. Um, so they. It's like um, in the old western movies, the the bad guy would wear a black hat, and then the the good cowboy would wear a white hat. I'll take your word for that. So I'm that's sure that's the case. Um, but yeah, in essence, our black hat hackers are the malicious actors. So they will do it for yeah. to damage your system or to get money and extort you. Whereas a white hat hacker is they've learned a vulnerability, 
they will then go and hit all these systems globally that use that same like third party application and then see if they can like break the system and then report it to you so you can repair it before the black so it's system it's kind of like that uh, penetration testing it's exactly that and more often that's how they mark themselves penetration testing so they'll initially hack you um, but without the intention of like extorting anything or like there's no malicious intent. They're actually doing you a favor saying these are your vulnerabilities, you need to go and fix those. That's exactly it. And then more often the contract comes with it after being like, you've seen what we can do. They've done it based on like, a proof of concept as to mm -hmm. how good they are for security. And that's where they were like, propose, um, would we like to use us for security? So it really is an interesting, it's an interesting aspect. Um, and I'm glad they're out there, but not the black hat factors. No. I'm really just picturing this like a, a Western where they're doing like see you at 12 noon, high noon. Yeah. I don't think I've watched a Western, but we can go with that. Yeah. That's epic though. That's very cool. So um what would you like people to take away from this podcast really? What do you think is the most important thing for people to remember? Uh, well I mean as you said, the most important thing is just be more scared than the next person. I don't want to obviously anyone to take away that they should be scared of going to the cloud because obviously I mean as the Older generations are moving to the cloud. It's can be a daunting task. They've been yes. used to desktop software, uh, having everything on premises. So now to them, it's like a daunting thing. Like, oh, is my data out there for everyone to see? And we're not trying to like instill fear that there's all these risks. It's just that we're trying to give you key points that what are the best practices and how can you just ensure that if a hacker does come, you are just that much more secure than the next person that they will just move on. They won't even bat, bat an eye at you. Like that. So it's not, not to be scared. It's just to be cognizant of what's out there and how to keep up to date with things. Awesome. Epic. Well, is that it? All done? I think so. Awesome. Thank you very much to everyone for joining. I hope that you learned something today. I think Gareth needs to go watch some Westerns now so that he knows my uh, references. I've got a lot of things to catch up on. But yeah, no, honestly, thanks for having me. It's been actually a great talk, even though I don't normally do like public things in essence, but no, it's been really, really fun to be on here. Oh, we were really glad to have you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks very thank, much. Thank you for joining everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Beyond Insights podcast. Please like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to right now. And please share with any of your colleagues or friends or family members that you think might benefit from listening to this podcast. That's all from us. Until next time, see you then.